Larry, good to see you. Eric, it's great to see you on this bright, sunny, beautiful time in New York City. Larry, speaking of bright and sunny, climate change has been a priority for BlackRock for two years already. How would you grade your progress to date? Well, I don't give myself grades, and other people do. <clears throat> I would ask you, how do you grade us? Uh, but in terms of where we are moving as an organization, and, and I assume you're using your ask question, not me, but the firm. Um, yes. And so I would, I, I would say uh, clearly um, we are witnessing a, a real tectonic shift in the dialogues that we are having with our clients. More and more clients are asking how can they design a more sustainable portfolio. More and more clients are looking to put money into various sectors. Even this past week, Eric, we had a, a client said, is there any such type of a value-based sustainable portfolio? When you think about sustainability, it's mostly growth because you, you, you're investing in new technologies or, you know, a, a, and, and so it has never been thought of as just a value type of product. It's more of a growth product. And more and more clients are looking at it across the spectrum of their portfolios. And depending on the type of client, Eric, some clients who are who have their business tethered to some liability, you know, they're being judged versus an index or something, those type of clients mm -hmm. need a, a different type of sustainable portfolio that may even actually have hydrocarbons in that portfolio, but we use our analytics and data to try to pick the best of the of every industry. And so we're 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 designing a portfolio that has um, better ESG or better sustainability metrics to it. And and we're doing quite a bit of that. And then we have clients who are saying, I want to be rid of all the different old technologies, old science. I want to be investing in the new technology, the new science. And so our job is to be working with the asset owners. And then the, from the other lens, Eric, in, in framing the question that he asked, how are we doing? The conversations we're having in our stewardship side related to the corporations and how are they moving towards uh, to, to more of a, a sustainable uh, a position, a, a how are they moving towards uh, being prepared for transition? I would say there has been a dramatic change in the dialogue from two years ago. Yes. So, so let me, let me frame it to you this way then: If yeah. you define and you do BlackRock's progress in terms of what it is doing for clients or what it's making available to clients. How far along are you relative to where you started and where you need to be? Well, where we need to be will intersect then where government is and where, where society is moving. I, I would tell you the capital markets is moving very rapidly. The capital markets worldwide is is moving. This is that tectonic shift that we we identify to all the business, all the CEOs. So I would say that if if I use the if I'm judging the question through the lens of conversations and changes of behaviors, it's enormous from two years ago. Uh, if 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 you ask me related to what percent of their portfolios. Uh, are being managed through the lens of sustainability, it's we're, it's we're still very early. Also, we do not have as much data as we need in terms of understanding how corporations are moving forward, too. As you know, in my letters, I did ask for every company to report under SASB and TCFD. That that is accelerating very rapidly. We believe this is going to accelerate even more in the next, in the coming months and years, whether it is because of government actions or what we are asking. But Eric, in my 44 years of doing this, I've never seen the speed in which this narrative is evolving and changing. I've never seen a speed in which portfolios are 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 being changed. But we're at the very early beginnings of this. I believe there will be a future, Eric, that all investments are going to be looked through sustainability. I believe that we are not going to see 100% of client portfolios. 
are going to be judged through the lens of sustainability as a risk factor. Yes. How long does that take? Well, it, 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 I don't know. It's going to take, it, it could take for some companies year, a few years and some other companies many, many years. It really depends on where society is taking this. If society is only asking public companies to make changes and not the rest of society, it's never going to happen to the fullest amount that I just su suggested. But if we have everybody saying we must move here, then it's going to be more rapid and the change is going to be good. But through all changes, changes are opportunistic. Change is disruptive. And so we need to be careful in how we design this. This has to be done through enormous long-term planning for society to do this effectively and well. You know, I look at this well, like I look at the pandemic, Eric, and I want to just use a reference. And this is why I do believe the pandemic is a good metaphor for what is going on in sustainability. The pandemic was an existential risk. It, it showed how fragile society is. I mean, when you step back and ask yourself how society navigated over the last 12 months, and segments of society have done very well and segments of society have done very poorly. I want to, if you take that same type of metaphor for where we are in sustainability, the Earth's health is deteriorating. So it's not like a new pandemic. And we see it getting sicker. And we have to stop that disease curve for the earth. And the sooner we start changing the course of that, of the, of, of carbon in, in our environment, the sooner we can stabilize um, glo our global earth's health. And, and so this is a bigger task, but I, but when you see the brilliance of technology and the brilliance of humanity that we were able to get a vaccination in 10 months for the pandemic, I am absolutely optimistic that we will find the technologies to rapidly change the direction of the earth. But it, that takes, because we're not at the beginning of the earth's poor health, we're, you know, we're, we're ac actually ac rapidly accelerating the, the earth's health uh, problems. And so it's going to require much more deliberate planning, much more deliberate investments to do this. It, and it just can't be done by BlackRock and other asset managers asking public companies to make changes. It has to be done across all society, or we're lying to ourselves. We will not get this done. So let me ask you this, Larry. We now have a very good idea of what President Biden is going to do about the climate crisis. He wants to cut U.S. greenhouse gas emissions to half their 2005 level before the end of this decade. Is that aggressive enough or too ambitious? Well, w w there's 127 countries before we announce this have already f announced some form of initiative towards movement towards the, the reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, unless there is changes in behaviors across all society, not just public companies, not just for disclosure of public companies, um, if, if there's not enough uh, investments towards bringing down the green premium of these new technologies, this can't happen. And using an example, we had solar and wind technology 30 years ago, and it was really expensive, 50, 60 times, 50%, 60% uh, greater than the cost of coal. 30 years later, wind and solar is cheaper than coal. We don't have 30 years. I mean, the president proposed a nine-year reduction. Um, and so it, to do this is we're going to require an enormous change in technology. Right now, you know, biofuels are 50% higher than hydrocarbons. Uh, uh, green hydrogen 
depending on the plant, 30 to 50 percent higher. For us to do this and to continue to have economic growth, it is about new technologies and new investments. I mean, 10 percent of the carbon footprint is from coal and cement. I have not heard anyone talk about how are we going to re change steel, that. You mean steel, steel, steel and cement, no? And steel, excuse me, steel and cement, yes. Um, and so it's going to require new technologies to sequester carbon. Um, and, and, and through the new technologies, I, let me just finish this one point. Because of the new technologies, there's going to be hundreds of new uh, unicorns. And so I'm excited about not the risk of, of transition. I'm excited about the opportunities. I also believe, and this is where some of the in, uh, some people disagree with me. I believe part of the solution is going to be the traditional hydrocarbon companies too. They have the science, they have the technology, they they have actually you know old uh, wells of energy of oil and gas, uh, these big fields that they could now repump in carbons into those wells, and they could do it probably more cheaply than any other thing at the moment. And so it's going to be a combination of old industry that's becoming new and new technologies that are going to change our world. So if you're that confident in the prospects for technological advancement, innovation that could create, as you say, all kinds of new unicorns, what is the right role for government to play? Because if the private sector, as it did largely with solar and wind, can solve this problem, what does the government need to do? Well, you saw to get a get, to get our vaccination in 10, 10 months required government involvement. I mean, billions if you look about billions of dollars of government involvement. Yeah, so I, I believe it's going to be a combination of government and private sector. Okay, one of the big issues that we're having, um, we don't have enough opportunity to invest in, 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 in sustainability in the United States. There are not enough projects in the United States right now. We have huge demand. And if you look at the valuations now of solar and wind versus, you know, solar and wind is, is, is the returns are quite modest today. There is a, there's a great need for this. So we would welcome and infrastructure sustainability projects that are being created by the government, and, and can they be financed by the private sector? Absolutely. But to get this done in nine years, Eric, I mean, let's just talk about biofuels for a second. We, we've been talking to one of the leading companies in biofuels, and we would, you know, we would we have investor demand to create a biofuel uh, facility in the Northeast. It may take years to get the permitting. So if we're going to do this in nine years or less, we, we, we have to then accelerate the permitting process. We're going to, you know, we're going to have to have local government working with state government, working with federal government. I, I could say loud and clear, Eric, the capital from the private sector is awaiting the leadership of government to start promoting this. We will be there. We have the capital. Now the question is, when will we see the projects and how quickly can those projects be, uh, uh, be permitted and beginning construction? There is so much desire for, for change. So I could say enthusiastically, we have a capital. We don't have the projects at this moment. The government inevitably will be spending billions, perhaps hundreds of billions, possibly trillions of dollars of its own money. Larry, the president has proposed or is contemplating a number of new revenue schemes to fund his agenda. There's a whole range. Uh, one we learned of recently would double the capital gains tax from 20 percent to 40 percent for wealthy Americans. Would you support a 40 percent capital gains tax? I would have to understand that. And I don't want to go into politics, Eric. I mean, I, 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 but... There is no question we need to find a way to raise the revenues. But I would also argue, I don't know if it would have to be hundreds of billions of dollars from the federal government. If they designed a public-private entity, we do not have to increase our deficits through this. If we created a structure in place where we have proper bidding for the projects from the private sector that they're being developed, they're, the, the permitting is being accelerated. So 
I actually believe there is such enormous rev uh, rev uh, reservoir of, of money ca capable to invest in none of this. And I would welcome the opportunity to, to talk to any government on, you know, how can we accelerate the ideas of moving forward? <clears throat> The Biden administration has announced many different things, from their infrastructure bill to sustainability, now revenues and taxes. Let's see how this all plays out and uh, and how this goes. But I'm not going to go at you know uh, comment about one tax versus another tax. I'll, you know that's a not a non-winning story. Well, no, I, that I respect that. The reason, Thank of course, you. I bring this up is because. Um, that particular approach, a capital gains tax, has implications for financial markets. That has implications for investment returns. Those are things that you're concerned about. And, for tax, and, and for tax as a sort of a third order effect, it might even have implications for BlackRock as a company. Two thirds of our assets are retirement assets. Uh, these are non-taxable entities, and and um, and and obviously, a large pools of our money are, are non-domiciled in the United States too, whether from Europe or the Middle East or Asia, or where uh, it, you know our taxable accounts are, are not that large. Um, and um, and 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 keep in mind, much since our, you, you, you asked a question related to individual monies, you know this is one of the reasons why we bought a Perio to do tax advantaged types of investments. So we we are anticipating rising taxes as an organization, and this is going to be a major component of our wealth management platform. But when I think about all our clients worldwide, it's a small component of our platform. And I would tell you, it's not going to change our, you know, 90 plus percent of our clients' behaviors. Larry, you were among the first CEOs in asset management to say climate risks are investment risks, and you've asked companies to disclose those risks. Um, but complying with your request is still a matter of choice for CEOs. What if it weren't a choice? If the United States really wants to take a global lead on climate change, shouldn't disclosure of those risks be a regulatory requirement? Great question. It is becoming a regulatory requirement in Europe. And so and so the key that we have been asking every government, we want to have one, uh, one taxonomy. We want to have one system of measurement. We cannot allow an arbitrage between one place of the world versus another on how we disclose. We don't want to disadvantage our companies versus other ones. So we are urging all governments, and hopefully at a COP26 this fall, when the governments all come together, they try to harmonize uh, disclosure. And once disclosure is harmonized and it's a level playing field, we are really excited about that because right now we're living under different standards. And I've always said, Eric, I would love the private sector to do it before government ever imposes this. And that was some of my messaging, too, because my messaging privately was, this is going to happen whether you like it or not. And now it's starting to happen, or it appears it may be happening. We, you know, we all should get prepared to doing this now. And, and, so, and, so, and what we have proposed with TCFD and SASB, if there's a better taxonomy, if there's better tools for measurement with consistency across the world, we're happy with that. But I want to just underscore again, if governments only ask private companies, excuse me, public companies, not government officials, are public companies to do this, and we're not asking the rest of society doing this, we are then putting public companies at a disadvantage. And what I'm frightened of, if we only ask the hard questions to the public companies, many public co companies that may are, are moving slower or don't have good disclosures, they're all going to go private. And we don't change the, net, the, the, the results of the net zero world by companies going private. And oh, that's, that's my a very good fear. point. So how, do you, how do you eliminate that arbitrage then, the public-private arbitrage? That's exactly what you're talking about. Well, the SEC does have powers over... Uh, private equity firms and their portfolios. They now are, you know, they 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 have um, uh, oversight over <clears throat> investment companies over a certain dollar amount. I don't remember what it was, a few billion dollars. Um, <clears throat> so that's a start. 
and uh, and the, but the bigger question is that, that we should encourage uh, as part of a as a as a comp country uh, that all companies are moving forward in this public or private. Now, part of TCFD is scope three, where you are then required to understand all your supply chain. And that's going to be right now. That's going to be quite difficult if your supply chain is not moving fast enough. And so even the execution of, you know, of how we implement what is already being discussed, you know, TCFD scope one, we could all do that's our own companies. We could do that. But then scope two and scope three, when you're going down your supply chain, there lies the issue. And, you know, I just urge every government, when I have a chance to talk to government, to focus on these things holistically, not just conveniently with public companies. We have too much pressure on public companies, and we don't ask the rest of society moving on. We are going to put our public companies at a disadvantage. And then more importantly, though, we're not going to get to a net zero. If we have, if we truly have the objective of changing the, the uh, our disease curve, as I call it, you know, related to the earth, Mm -hmm. The only way we can change that is getting all of society behind it, not just the few, you know, the thousands of hundred uh, of public companies. That's a start, but it's not. It's not going to. We're not going to get there. So it would help, though, if the SEC, under its new chairman Gary Gensler, were to pass a rule requiring that, at the very least, public companies in America identify and disclose climate risks. That would help. No question, and I and, and but I don't think it's a, it, I don't think it's going to be a big burden, mm -hmm. and I, that's you know I I just don't believe this is going to be a big issue. The one thing that I've urged government, so because we don't we're not confident in all the taxonomies yet, that there is at least a safe harbor. What I'm hearing from a lot of companies, how do you measure it? Some of these measurements are not right. How do we make sure we don't just get caught up in a class action suit? So what? And in my conversation with regulators across the world, they, they understand this issue of safe harbor. We don't want to use this as a mechanism to have just class action suits for all companies because they have a measurement wrong. And But we are at risk at that if we don't. You know, we encourage companies to, uh, to report, uh, but there's a safe harbor for a period of time until all governments come together with a real quantifiable taxonomy that we could all agree upon. Larry, for a company as committed to the environment, to society, and to good governance as BlackRock is, and you've made that clear in your letters to CEOs and your chairman's letters, um, it has, as I'm sure you know, something of a dismal record on ESG shareholder resolutions. Why is that? Um, well, I don't agree with that, that. That the framing of the question. I don't believe we have. Well, it. well, let, 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 let me let me define it. Well, let me define it. Me, there was a study me, done that I am familiar with, and I'm sure you are as well, that found that BlackRock supported only three percent of ESG shareholder resolutions, okay. where yes. the so fifty largest fund families in America, on average, supported forty-six. So, Eric, let's talk about the numerator. Uh, as a denominator for a second, um, there are thousands of companies we judge and review every year. I think last year, I don't have the statistic in front of me, I think there was 150 odd sustainability issues on a proxy. So, I, you know, that study is fraught with, uh, with inaccuracies. Um, okay. In that 150 companies, that is a fact. OK, but across the spectrum, we have the biggest corporate stewardship team in the world. We have more dialogue with more companies than anyone. And I would challenge anybody to, to tell us we don't. Uh, we have a we have more engagement with more companies. And I could tell you we are moving more and more companies. And many of them are not hitting a proxy um, uh, 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 issue. I would tell you this year the results will be quite different than last year too, on the, because there are more and more what we're witnessing. There's three x more, maybe even greater, 
sustainability issues on the proxies this year than last year. So that's actually accelerating. And I think, you know, we're in the middle of proxy season right now, but I think those results will show, and year to date will show we are voting alongside some of the measures with much greater frequency than we did a year ago. What I said in my letters too, though, Eric, we said we are going to be patient. We're long-term capital. In many cases, we are not going to just do this because we want to be measured by these places that I do believe they're, the way they measure is wrong because they're not taking into the entirety. They're just conveniently using the public proxies as a measurement tool. But I do believe, you you know, to frame your question, you're going to ask me next year and say, why the change, Larry? You know, it looks really good. <laughs> but I don't, But that doesn't tell the whole story. It really doesn't tell the whole story. Larry, some critics say that CEOs aren't doing enough to agitate for societal change on everything from the environment to voting rights, and it's a very wide spectrum. There's also a growing chorus of voices that argues CEOs have no place in such matters because they're matters of government, matters for elected officials. And that CEOs should do what Milton Friedman said, maximize profits. What do you say? Well, I think I've been la very loud on what I'm saying, and I'm gonna be loud again. Uh, first of all, um, I could speak for myself. I don't wanna speak for other CEOs. I'm not engaged in politics. What, when I, I write about issues around long-termism, and issues that were gonna impact my clients. Uh, and everything we talk about is around principles. So even the issues around voting access, that wasn't political, that was principle-based. And every word that I wrote was highly principled-based because I believe the foundation of American democracy is, is based on American capitalism and they're interconnected. Uh, but related to a voice, I, I, I would tell you, uh, Eric, our voice has resonated so loudly with our clients. I think among the asset managers, we have probably the largest voice, um, and we're, I'm willing to be that that spokesperson. And you know, I get the attended people from the left and right uh, arguing with me as you frame the question properly. Um, but over the last rolling 12 months, we were awarded $527 billion, and and, and so our voice is resonating with our clients, um, and. I talk about stakeholder capitalism. I would tell you, I get more um, feedback from my employees, one of my stakeholders, about our voice and how proud they are. I get more clients' feedback about our voice. And it's, it's, it shows up in the flows of assets they're awarding us, their share of wallet. Um, I believe our voice is imperative in the communities where we work. And, and to frame it with a conclusion of Milton Friedman, if you are a, a advocate and you're, you're, you have a strong voice on behalf of your three major stakeholders, your clients, your employees, your community, your ultimate stakeholder, your shareholders receive strong, durable profitability. And, I, and that proves out. If you look at the companies that have voices, companies that have um, strong stakeholder um, uh, capitalism as a part of their principles, those companies are performing better than the ones who are silent. And I would just tell you very clearly, and you know that from Bloomberg, our employees want us to have a voice. Our employees are asking us to have a voice. I mean, our, our employees are much greater in terms of saying, you know, when are we speaking louder? Not I don't get the feedback from my employees. When are you going to be quiet, Larry? Uh, and I can tell you, you know, there are some clients that ask more about why we're having that voice, but I think the results of our performance, I think the results of, of, of what we are trying to do is really speaking loudly. You know, as I said at the beginning, we as an asset management company, we're, we have a really important role. We're the nexus between the owners of capital and the companies in which where we manage. And we have a really big responsibility uh, 
And now managing $9 trillion of other people's money, that responsibility is enormous. When we manage two-thirds of our assets are retirement assets, we have to be a voice of long-termism. We're not a voice of the tick-tock of the day of markets going up and down and why and all that. As you know, that is 90 percent of the narrative on any media channel today, on any newspaper. It is about the ups and downs of markets, why and all that. And it's actually uh, harmful in my mind to the long-term saver who is now trying to become a long-term investor. And so what we have tried to do to be as good as we can as a stakeholder uh, to focus on the needs of our clients, the needs of our uh, employees, which then translate into the needs of community to provide those long-term profits. And, you know, we went public, you know, a little over 20 years ago at 14. Now we're something around 800. I think it's okay. It worked out. Larry, thank you for joining me here at the Bloomberg Green Summit. Always a pleasure. Eric, good to see you. Thank you. Everyone stay safe, please. Same to you.